Why do people go bald? Why are baboons bums red? What's a light year? Why do leaves go brown in the autumn? Why do monkeys like bananas? Why do some things glow in the dark? Why do animals not understand? Why do minus heat stay after a year? Don't know the answer? Ask the Naked Scientists. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask the Naked Scientists with me, Sue Marchant and Dave Ansell. All right, well, let's go to our first question. Hi to uh, Mike in Peterborough, who says, Dr Dave, why do satellites sometimes play up or malfunction whenever they pass over the Bermuda Triangle? Um, there's lots of different reasons why a satellite could play up. One of the major ones is you get space weather, whereby the sun can throw out lots of high, um, incredibly fast charged particles, mostly things like protons and electrons. Mm-hmm. And if you get a solar storm, they can crash into the satellite and mm-hmm. they can cause great big charges to build up in certain bits of the satellite and they sort of arc across, you get sparks inside the satellite. If they're inside the electronics, that can cause damage. Just this particle smashing into the electronics can cause damage. You get meteorites hitting satellites, which can damage, which if they hit something imp- uh, important, then they can wreck the satellite. If you look at any old satellite, it's pockmarked with lots of little tiny things, smaller than a grain of dust, or smaller than a grain of sand hitting it. They hit it so fast, they sort of blow little craters in the satellite. But why this should... I'm not sure whether there is an effect over the um, Bermuda Triangle. It'd be very hard to know if there was. But there is. They've made loads of films about it, so it must be true. (laughs) So it must be true. I I do know that all of the stories about um, ships, particularly more ships going down in that triangle, if you actually look at the statistics and compare it to... I mean, it probably is a slightly more dangerous Mm. area of ocean than other bits of ocean, but ships go down for un- unexplained reasons all over the place all the time. Um, anything from monster waves to the fact that they just happen to fall apart in, I mean, but there in the middle are, of the ocean. But there are unusual currents out there, though. There, are, there have been other explanations involving um, methane hydrates, mm. whereby if you get a lot of methane it can, in very high pressure, it can form this kind of strange crystal mm. with water. Um, it can get trapped in basically ice it's called methane hydrates. Um, clathrates um, and if you get a little earthquake or something you can release the pressure and it will release lots of gas that produces lots of bubbles and if you've got lots of bubbles in water then the water is less dense than normal so ships will sink, will float lower in it and mm. if, it, if they float low enough then they might sink um, it's also been suggested this could cause planes to fall out of the sky because they don't have enough oxygen for the engines to run but at the last time I looked there isn't a big effect anyway to explain it's a little bit weird, I think. Mike and Peterborough, I hope that answers your question. Let's go to the phones next. Hello to Lou. Hello. Oh, hello, Dr Sue. Hello, Dr Dave. You're through to Dr Dave. What is your question? Um, uh, my question is about zero-point energy. How do we know that it exists? OK, zero-point energy. If you imagine you've got an atom, you've got electrons orbiting that atom... And due to quantum mechanics, those electrons can only orbit in a certain levels. They can only have certain energies. Um, we normally call the lowest energy state. They sit in first energy level, then they can go up another energy level, another energy level. And then they can gain and lose. If you, they get hit by a photon or get hot, they can gain energy. They can lose that again by emitting photons, and so they can glow. The zero-point energy, the idea is that the electrons are orbiting, uh, and while they're orbiting, even at the lowest energy which they, they can orbit at, They've still got some energy. They've still got some kinetic energy. They're going round and round and round this atom. Um, people call this the zero point energy because, it, although at absolute zero, if you took all of the heat out of it that you could, the electron would still have this much energy. Um, and you can prove that it has that, that kinetic energy, but there's no way of getting it out while still being an atom. The electron can't get any lower in energy. It doesn't work. It wouldn't be an atom anymore. There are some people who think that you can then release all this energy via some bizarre means and then use it in some useful way. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Lou, take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. On the text, Dr Dave, uh, Jack, who's age 12, how likely is it that aliens exist, Dr Dave? If, it depends what you mean by aliens. If you mean some form of alien life in the universe... I mean, we don't really know how likely... I mean, we have only seen one example of life um, developing, and that's on our Earth. So we can kind of... um, But it's quite possible, actually, that life has developed more than once on the Earth, or it's definitely become 
there's been some very, very traumatic things happening at the beginning of the Earth's life. And it's conceivable that life has happened more than once on the Earth, um, created more than once, but it's certainly been created once. And I think the odds are there's an awful lot of planets in the universe. There's an immense number in this galaxy, um, billions upon billions upon billions of planets. And I think it's very, 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 very unlikely that there aren't loads and loads of them with life on them. How many of those have got life on them which has got complex enough to be able to ask the question, is there life, is another question. Because it's taken five billion years for life to get to the point of us to wander around um, and look and, and ask the question, is there life on other planets? So is there intelligent life on other planets? Again, there probably are enough planets out there that there's almost certainly... I mean, it would be really depressing if there wasn't. But whether it's close enough for us ever to be able to say hi is a completely different matter. Because I th just from the fact that it's taken um, at least three billion years of life to get humans who we could... So if it take... Then the odds of intelligent life are obviously much, much lower than normal life. So the odds of us being able to find inte another intelligent species is less high, but... I, almost certainly there is, um, I, I think personally, that there's almost certainly alien life out there, although it's very, very hard to know unless we find some other life somewhere else. Dave, you actually said, oh, you actually put yourself on the line because no, you said, no, it's not scientifically thing. Well, as, as Queen Vita of Planet Voluptua, you know, I have to tell you, and Captain Catherine Janeway, uh, she, um, you know, she's out there looking all the time. So, Jack, yeah. um, I think that Dave is sort of saying, Yes, I, I it is quite likely. It's, quite, it's very, very, very likely that there is in the universe. Whether we'll be able to find it is another matter. It would, it would be lovely lifetime. if there was. I, um, I think so, yeah. I yeah. mean, if, if we could find life on Mars, which is what NASA are looking for, or um, even evidence of ancient life on Mars, then that would increase the chances of there being life in the universe incredibly. Because if there's been two planets in our solar system which have developed life, mm. then virtually any solar system out there has probably got life on it. Um, this time, Dave, Ivan says, um, if you take archaeology or dig in the ground, you can find things from the past. With that in mind, how much has the Earth actually grown or what is the rate of growth? That's interesting because there's all of those layers. There are lots and lots of layers. Um, the real thing is that the layers aren't being build up, built up everywhere in the world. The places where you get the layers built, being built up are in the valleys and in the sea as well. Um, what's going on is that you've got mountains and they're getting eroded by um, by um, things like frost cracking up the rocks and then the rain washing the rocks down and get plants working their roots into rock and breaking it up. Mm -hmm. And then water erodes that and then that carries all these lumps of rock down and get battered down smaller and smaller and smaller until you get mud, basically. And that gets washed down in the rivers. And when the rivers slow down, that gets... Um, they, they, this comes out of suspension, it falls to the bottom mm. and it um, b builds up on the ground. If you've got the thing called a floodplain, then every traditionally every year or every couple of years you get a big flood, you get lots of rain with a big flood, that would bring lots of really muddy water and it would flood the whole of the plain and all the mud in that water would drop out and the ground would rise by a, yeah, a few millimetres depending on, or a few centimetres depending on exactly where you are. Mm. And so you get a layer. And then every year you get another layer and another layer and the ground builds up. Sometimes in some areas the, the ground is actually sinking due to, plate te to um, tectonics and earthquakes. Um, earthquakes are um, causing one area of the uh, ground to fall down. And other, 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 the same way as other areas go up and create mountains. Um, and so in the areas which are falling you get layers building up and up and up. But it's only the same, it's only the matter which is being eroded off the mountains. The only way that the Earth is actually changing size is um, meteorites falling onto the Earth, and that's not a huge, it's not a very large amount um, for, uh, of mass falling onto the Earth at any time. It's it's tens of thousands, of, it's thousands and thousands of tons. I don't have a number in my head, mm. but the, so that spread out over the whole Earth is. Fractions of a millimeter. It's not like the elastic band year. ball then that you keep adding to and it gets bigger, but you've got to add it in an equal layer. 
Um, I mean, the, the Earth is get, you are, you're getting stuff falling on there, but most mm. of the the layers in arche- archaeological layers are just because of places where you actually find stuff, mm. which is still in beautifully preserved, is where you're getting lots of sedimentation, mm. lots of mud falling on top of it. Because mm. the places where you're not getting sedimentation, where you're getting erosion, like up, up in mountains, um, buildings get eroded just as much as rocks do, so they don't exist at all, and there's no evidence for them. Mm. So you only, so you tend to find good archaeology in places where you're getting deposition and sedimentation if you're enjoying ask the naked scientists then you might like to check out the naked scientists our regular roundup of the world's best science each week we take a look at the latest science news talk to top researchers working at the coalface of discovery and also get our hands dirty with a science experiment that you can join in with too so make it a date and prepare to strip down science on the web at nakedscientists.com slash podcast now, Mucker in Northampton um, says, Neil Armstrong went to the moon. Is this fact or fiction? What are your thoughts, Dave? Because Mucker says he's sceptical. There are a lot of people who are sceptical. Um, they come up with all sorts of reasons why, um, why, why it's obviously a fake. Um, some of them, they, come, they say things like, you can't, if you look at the photos, you can't see the stars. But the reason why you can't see the stars in the photos is if you're taking a photograph of someone walking around on a brightly lit moon, um, you don't set your exposure well to be able to see the stars. And the stars are very, very dim compared to the brightness of the moon. And so they're just so dim compared to the brightness of the moon that it's not exposed enough and you can't see them, so the sky looks completely black. If you're walking around on the moon and you look looked at a mixture of the uh, the moon and the sky, then the brightness of the moon itself would so overwhelm the, the stars in the sky, you wouldn't be able to see them, which is most of the reason why you can't see stars um, on Earth during the day. Um, they've got all sorts of other ones, like um, all of the um, shadows not being parallel, um, but the ground wasn't flat, and if, you, if the ground isn't flat, then shadows aren't parallel. Mm. Um, and there's also the, basically all of the reasons I've seen. It's very easy to sh- show why they're not why they're not really very good reasons why it was faked. But the biggest reason I think that why he must have landed on the moon is that if he didn't land on the moon, then the Russians would have known. Apart from anything else, the Russians had agents all the way through NASA. I mean, the, the Russians basically stole the designs for the space shuttle, let alone everything else. And for a start, the Russians were able to tell they weren't on the moon by looking with their own telescopes and looking with their own radio telescopes and knowing where the signals are coming from. Um, and even if the Americans somehow managed to fake that, then the Russians would certainly be able to, uh, would almost certainly have had agents agents in amongst NASA somewhere which would have been who would have told them, told them that it was all a fake and the, and it would have been really in the Russians interest to blow this open as a fake because it would be a great example of the capitalists not really doing what they're saying they are as they didn't I think it's almost I can't I just it just doesn't make sense for it to all have been faked and the Americans to got away with it what does make sense sometimes I wonder right we've got Dom on the telephone now hello Dom hello um, my question is Yep. Uh, are deodorants um, really easy to burn, and uh, why do they have gas in them? Okay, you're thinking of spray, de- spray can deodorants. Um, the deodorant itself isn't necessarily particularly easy to burn. Um, it's probably held in a solvent, something to um, keep everything mixed up in a liquid, which evaporates quite quickly, so it dries out quite quickly. And most things which evaporate quite quickly are flammable. They tend to be um, hydrocarbons of one form or another. And so the solvent is probably quite flammable. But also with a spray can, you want some way of getting the, pushing the spray out of the can. The way they do that is by having compressed gas, quite often a liquid, uh, something like butane, um, compressed in the can. And then as it, then as it pushes the uh, liquid out through the spray can, some of that gas is in amongst it, which also helps to break up into little um, droplets and you get nice fine spray. And the, the, um, they used to use chlorofluorocarbons, which um, weren't flammable and were very safe. Unfortunately, they had the effect of wiping out the ozone layer. So they stopped using those and they've replaced them with um, gases like butane and propane and other much more flammable gases, um, which don't have the same problems with the um, ozone layer. OK, Dom. OK. Thanks very much indeed. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. 
Um, another one here, Dave. Can we ask Dr. Dave how much weight is added to the planet each year through photosynthesis? It has been a mind worm of mine for years. Hair flick in Felixstowe. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> photosynthesis. Indeed. Well, the Earth, if you add up kind of all of the plants in the, on, on the Earth and you look at how much sort of dry mass they produce, how much... Um, how much sugar they sugars they produce and um, carbohydrates and things they produce about um, three about sort of six or seven trillion tons or no, so about about three trillion tons of um, carbohydrates really? every year, um, which is a lot of mass. But the thing is, it's not actually being added to the planet. You um, photosynthesis essentially you take in light mm. that converts. Um, some water and some carbon dioxide into sugar. Um, and then that sugar, and then also very, very quickly, something else will come along and eat it and convert those back into mm. carbon dioxide and water. So there's not, there's no actual change in mass um, to the whole planet because all the things which you're using to make the sugar from are coming from the, um, from the earth to start with. So there's no overall change in mass. The only change in mass would be this um, equals mc squared, so the energy um, produced, um, the increase in mass um, due, um, because of Einstein's equals mc squared from the energy, and that's going to be very, very, very small in comparison to the mass, um, like minute sort of um, hundred trillion, so probably maybe um, maybe a couple of tons. But again, because they, they get, it's get eaten and that energy is released, then that mass is also released very quickly so if you added it up um over the whole year and it's going to be far less than a ton maybe a couple of kilograms um for me equals mc squared but yeah it doesn't actually have any effect on the mass of the earth now then dr dave um a question here from jim who says i understand how planes make vapor trails but i'm just wondering why or how they can start and stop them at certain places in the sky um if you see one there is a good chance you will see other planes make them in the same area in the sky. It's not like this is it, there's some special place in the sky. Is it they're making their their path for some reason or marking their path? Could you please get back with why this happens and why it is done at special places? Just, yeah, it's, it's a I good wonder question. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, vapor trails they can be created for a couple of reasons. Um, most of the ones you see um, high up in the sky are because when you burn fuel, jet fuel, which is kerosene, you're burn, it's a hydrocarbon, you're, it, they, uh, you've got hydrogen and carbon in it, the carbon burns to form carbon dioxide, the hydrogen burns to form H2O water. So you're getting lots of water produced, um, so you're getting lots of humid, hot, humid air coming out the back of these jet engines. Mm -hmm. It then cools down when it expands, and when it meets the cold air around it, especially when you're very, very high up. And this cold air um, basically causes the water, as it cools down, the water condenses to form little droplets or even ice crystals if you're high enough up. Mm -hmm. And um, therefore you get a, a trail of um, basically cloud, as a vapour trail is. Um, you can also sometimes produce them um, in wingtip vortices. Um, you sometimes see these in um, films on TV. Um, basically, if, a, if, um, if you're in a very, very damp, humid air, um, when the wind, the, the air coming off the back of the wing, you get a vortex, an air of spinning air, and that can, um, the middle of that air can be at um, a lower pressure, and that causes the air to expand and to cool, and you can sometimes get a little bit of condensation in that. Mm. But th those are very, those don't happen very often. The major one is um, the condensation, and of course, how long this, this, these um, droplets last will depend on how humid the air is and how warm the air is. So you've got very, very humid air, which is almost forming a cloud already, and you um, put a load of extra moisture into it from a jet engine. Then that, um, then those droplets are going to basically not evaporate ever. They're going to stay there for a long time, and the um, vapor trail is going to last for ages. If you get very, 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 very dry air then it can, actually, it can mean that the droplets don't last very long, possibly not at all, and so you don't form a trail at all. And in between, you get trails which last different amounts of time um, as the droplets evaporate eventually. Um, and so, yes, it's basically you get different areas of air, um, different altitudes, you can have different humidities and different temperatures. Um, and also you could get areas where you're getting a lot of up, 
an updraft with lots of um, warm, moist air, which a plane flies through, and all of a sudden it produces a beautiful, beautiful vapor trail, mm -hmm. and it carries on at the same altitude, and you move into some different air, air, cold, dry air, and it doesn't produce any at all. Um, or especially warm, dry air, then you certainly not, then it's going to be least likely to. Um, and so, yeah, they can turn on and turn off. They're not. There's, there's, there's no kind of cunning um, marking to tell other planes where to go. Mm, right. yeah, the only trails which are like that are the ones you get off the red red arrows, where they basically heat up diesel um, and evaporate diesel, and that condenses to form droplets to form clouds, and they can put colours into it to make the coloured trails. Which is clever. Which is yeah, I think if like, you were a jet pilot, so you could do Looks that. Cool. You would, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, Laurie in Walton has a question. Why is it that free divers, that's one who dive without oxygen tanks, don't get the bends? Very, very good question. Um, the bends is basically because um, when you take a deep breath of air, um, there's oxygen in it which your body can use to react with food, um, create energy, to create carbon dioxide. There's also nitrogen in the air. About 80% of the air is nitrogen. Um, normally that doesn't do anything. It's very unreactive and it just sits around and doesn't do anything. Mm. If you go down to very, very high pressure, though, more of it will dissolve inside all of your tissue, inside of all the liquid in your body and inside the tissues. And that's fine. You, it doesn't cause very any real problems if you stay at that pressure. Mm. But if you then come up too quickly, then the then that gas it will go from being dissolved. And it's a bit like when you open a to to form a gas, a bit like when you open a can of Coke or mm. a bottle of Coke. The, what, at high pressures, lots of carbon dioxide dissolved in the bottle of Coke. When you release the pressure, it now wants to be gas again, so it forms lots of bubbles. And a bottle of Coke, that's just kind of cool and tastes nice. But if that's happening with nitrogen inside your body, then you're forming lots of little bubbles inside your tissues and inside your blood. It can block off blood flow and it can cause immense pain, especially in your joints, which is the bends. That's particularly a problem if you're a diver because you take down a whole bo a compressed bottle of air which has got like two hours, a couple of hours or maybe an hour's worth of um, air in it. So it's like um, several metres cubed of air and all of that nitrogen is then, can then possibly dissolve inside your tissues um, and that can cause great problems. Um, if you just go down if it, with a single lungful of air, um, there's two reasons why free divers don't have a major problem. One of them is that they're not actually down for very long, so it doesn't so the nitrogen doesn't have very much time to dissolve in your body. Mm. The other thing is there's only a single lungful there, so there's less gas to dissolve, so there's less possible uh, possibility for problems. I think they can get the bends if they try very hard, but uh, yeah, basically they don't have, they're not really down for long enough for it to dissolve. That's it for this week. Our doctors will be back with me next week for more Ask the Naked Scientist. But don't forget you can also catch them on the Naked Scientist podcast, which you can find on the Naked Scientist website, www.nakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientists are sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com. <laughs>